Good morning. We're watching online. We're super cool. But you are glad you're watching. Aren't you glad they're watching? But we'd love to have you be with us. So if you uh, have notes, you can take those out. You can pull up the app and they can, can follow along. We are in a series uh, called Identity, and we're looking at our values. We've got five of those. We normally put those into a, a target uh, image because... Your values are the things that you shoot for in life, the things you're aiming at. Just naturally, you aim at certain things. And you may aim at nothing, and you'll hit it every time. Um, Or you may aim at something, but the wrong thing, and you probably hit that too. But what if you started aiming at the things that God said mattered most? What if you start aiming at the things that God says matters most? So we believe our, val- our values kind of cover those things, the inspired word of God, the intrinsic worth of every person, and intimate walk with God. And this month we're talking about, and say it with me, ready, set, go, an investment work of discipleship. So this idea of discipleship is something that God invites every believer into, uh, wants every believer to uh, live out, flesh out in their life. Unfortunately, uh, many believers do not. Um, Dallas Willard, if you've ever read him, then you've got a pretty sharp mind because he's a challenge to read sometimes. But Dallas Willard calls what the church does most of the time the great omission, not the great commission. Does that jar you a little bit? So the commission is what we're going to be called to do. We're supposed to go do this thing. And the great commission, the Matthew chapter 28 uh, passage is kind of our theme passage for this whole idea. But the great omission is that we omit calling people to be students of Jesus. We say, oh yeah, come to faith, come to faith, come to faith. But we never say, follow Jesus, study Jesus, seek to be like Jesus. We omit calling people to be disciples, and then we omit training them to do what he did. And so part of what we want to do is say, we, we want to take out those omissions. We want to put back in what the great commission is all about, which is calling you to follow Jesus as the one you should emulate, you should want to be like, be a student, follow him as closely as possible, and we'll help you do that. And will train you to learn how to do what he called us to do and to live like he lived so you can love like he loved. And when you do those things, things begin to radically change your life. So here's a little statement that, that we've, we say here, if you do our mentoring experience, which is a class that teaches you how to disciple. The idea of being a mentor is just a contemporary way of saying being a, a discipler, a disciple who disciples others, a discipler, a mentor. So if, you, if, you're, if your neck swivels, does your neck swivel? Not too far. You can read on the back of the wall, we've got this statement that is called our vision statement. And some of you know it by heart. If you do, just kind of say it with me that we are becoming a loving community of growing disciples, mentoring the next generation to live the mission of Jesus through the power of the gospel. Okay. So that's on the wall. It's on our website. It's on our app. It's a lot of places. Um, so we hope that you begin to see that that could be a vision for you, that your life could, could be a part of that. That third thing, the mentoring the next generation, that's discipleship. That's discipleship. So here's a little statement that's in your notes on the screen. Um, to disciple is to help or assist another to discover, establish, and refine their spiritual identity. It's the process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of of others. That's what being a disciple is all about. Helping or assisting someone else. Discover! What is the discover thing? When you meet Jesus, when you meet him, you discover this life that God has for you, this thing that he wants to do in you, this love relationship that he wants to be never separated from. You discover that that exists and you want it. And when we say we want it, we embrace it because we acknowledge who Jesus is, something happens in us. The Bible calls it, it's a born again experience. It's a feeling or sense of being saved or rescued or redeemed, brought into God's loving embrace. And when that happens to us, we've discovered something that should rock our world. But unfortunately, a lot of us stop there. We stop with the discovery of Jesus. We ever never had his faith and our belief system established in who he is and what scriptures reveal about who God is and who we are. It's never been established because we've never been trained and, and then it's never really being refined. And so we end up not really knowing who we are instead of believing what God says about who we are. We believe what the world says about who we are. And it is some distorted image of ourselves. Most of us in that sense of identity, sense of being, sense of self, it's a twisted sense of what the world says about us 
which usually doesn't reflect anything about what God says about us. And so you might be under the notion that it's about what you do because you're a human doing. And so you're wrapped up in your job. And if your job's going great, does that give you a sense of stability? Yeah, it does. It does. But it's a false sense of security. It's a false sense of stability because what happens the moment you lose your job? Your security's gone. Your identity's shattered. God wants you to, he doesn't, he doesn't mind that you have a sense of stability in your job. That's great. You just need more stability that only he can bring. What if you think you're really stable because you've got a great family? Your family's wonderful. Maybe the family you grew up in was terrific. Everybody looked to them and said, man, they're amazing. That gives you a sense of stability. But what happens when you find out that your parents stayed together just long enough so you could get out of the house and then they divorced? And then all of a sudden, wow, your sense of family's been rocked and, and you're wondering, who am I now? I thought I was this, but I'm not. You see, I hope your family is stable, but your family isn't the place you should build your identity on. You see, God's got so much more that will give you lasting stability. I mean, not just lasting in this life, but lasting into the next. He wants to give you stability that comes from a different kind of sense of being, a different kind of identity. And that's where we've been all year. And we'll never really leave that space because that is the space and practice of discipleship. You see, here's the deal. Is if you do not effectively change the patterns of your thought, you will not change the pattern of your life. If you do not effectively change the pattern of your thought, you cannot change the pattern of your life. All of us have patterns in our lives. We follow those patterns. We, we, drew, we were drawn to them because we thought they would give us stability, they would give us meaning, they would give us purpose. Maybe it's a pattern of work, 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 you know, off to work I go, you know, hi-ho, hi-ho, for I've got bills to show, right? I, I, I do work because that's what my pattern of family was. I grew up in that kind of a family, work, 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 and we had a work ethic, and it's great, it's beautiful, but that stability is only going to go so far. So maybe you have a pattern of work or a pattern of play because your family were players or a pattern of recreation or a pattern of drug abuse or alcohol abuse or sexual distortion. You see, we all got patterns to life and those patterns in life are there because we keep going there and it just wars, makes a deeper and deeper and deeper pattern and God wants to rock your patterns and give you a new pattern if you'll take it. But it's a, part, it's a participation. It's a, it's a co-oping that we're doing with him. He brings salvation to us, something we cannot earn. He brings that to us, but he wants us to work out what he's given us. He puts in his presence, now we work out his presence. And we do that, Romans 12 too, beautiful little verse. If you've never read Romans 12, go home over the Thanksgiving break, read that. I'm going to be preaching on that in, in, in uh, December. But look at this little verse. Let's say it, say it together. Ready, set, go. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's kind of where we're going to really camp out a lot today on just that notion. Why? Because the patterns of your thought creates the pattern of your lives. And God says you can actually change the pattern of your life by changing the pattern of your thoughts. You can change the pattern of your life by changing the pattern of your thought. That's what discipleship is, is it's this invitation. And this invitation will not move forward. There will be very little progress if you fail to do this thing that we've been talking about for some time throughout the whole month, which is called training. Training. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, 8, one of my favorite verses about training in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul says, do not waste time. And by the way, if you're here and you were here last week, I'm not going to pick on football at all because I want you to go home this afternoon and just enjoy some football. Um, is there football this afternoon? Of course there is, right? Please enjoy it. Um, just don't watch it all day, or for days and days and days. But I'm not going to pick on it. Um, do not waste time. Instead, train yourself to be what? To be godly. This is just godlike. Train myself to be like Jesus. That's what he's saying. Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits for both this life and the life to come. Promising. God says, I will give you benefits if you engage in this thing about training. So we want to think about what would that look like for us to be seriously committed if our brain, if, our, if what we think and how our mind works makes these paths in our life. We want to work to train our brain in a different direction. To train our brain, the most powerful tool you've been given by God is the tool of your brain. 
And some of us have um, let the world hijack our brains and literally we're following a pattern the world says, this is the way to go. And Christianity is a shifting of that saying, no, God calls me a whole different direction. We invite you into that direction. Let's talk about what that looks like. Three big things need to take place for us if we're going to do the next thing. Before you can effectively... um, Before you can effectively, this next little line should be up there, but maybe it's not going to come to me. Before you can effectively invest in another, right? Discipling, right? I'm I'm going to help or assist another. Before you can invest in another, you've got to invest in yourself, in yourself. Three ways that I'm going to say that we will help you invest in you. Three ways we'll help you invest in you so you can invest in others, so you can invest in God's kingdom. The first one is how you see yourself. Say that with me. How I see myself, how I see myself. The second one is how I behave myself. How I behave myself. That's good. That's your part. Third one is how I reproduce myself. How I reproduce myself. How many of you have biological children? How many have biological children? Look at you. You're so fruitful. Awesome. You are, you're made to be biologically reproductive. You're made for that. Spiritually, you are also made to reproduce yourself spiritually. Spiritually, it's the best sign of a growing person is when they're reproducing something good in their life because what God's doing in their life. And so we want to help you change how you, say it with me, see yourself, behave yourself, reproduce yourself. Say it again. See myself, behave myself, reproduce myself. When those things are happening, when you're saying, ah, that's what God's doing in my life, I, I am really, I'm, I don't see myself the way I used to see myself. It isn't about what I own. It's not about who I know. It's not about what I possess. It's not about what I do. It's about what he's done for me. It's about who I am in relationship with him. And when that begins to happen, your world gets rocked and everything changes. And for too many of us, nothing has changed except for we made this discovery that God loves us, but nothing else changed because we've omitted the making of disciples and we've omitted training ourselves to do what Jesus would do. And so don't omit it, put it back in and say, those things are critical and crucial for me to to move forward, to, to be the person that God wants me to be. I need to change how I see me, how I behave myself and how I reproduce myself. Beautiful little text. So one of my favorite passages about changing how I see myself is in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse, verse 21. Beautiful, beautiful little passage. Amazing first chapter. This whole chapter is great. Go and read that one too. Please go home and read your Bibles. Um, but this one little verse is, is pretty sweet. He says, uh, once, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, not so good so far. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. <laughs> I, I chuckle a little bit because all those things, I fall short of all those things. And so do you. Because none of you would probably say, oh, I'm so holy. If you did, we'd probably go, yeah, right. <laughs> right? Uh, Holier than thou, people really are not holier than thou. They just wear a mask, a holy mask. But God says he wants to present us holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. And I would bet that most of us, if we've got anybody around us, we would not be people that would say, oh yeah, there's nothing we could accuse you of. Oh, you are absolutely blameless. You've never done anything wrong. Oh, you're so holy. We may not even want that. But God says, that's how I see you. So if you're going to change how you see yourself, you've got to begin to recognize that God is doing something in you that is going to incrementally move you closer to that, but he already sees you as that. It's going to move you incrementally closer to that, but he already sees you as that. He already sees you. He presents you. Jesus presents you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. I mean, I, I hope you like me, but I, I, I was accused this week of something. It happens, right? I did a funeral, and, and it was a beautiful funeral. It was a, a sweet brother that, that passed away uh, after a battle with um, dementia, and, uh, but just a dear, dear, dear friend. He served uh, on our volunteer maintenance team for about 12 years, served by serving, served by showing up and cleaning and repairing, and just was a, was a great servant. And, uh, and this week, 
uh, we got to remember some of the amazing things that he did. Went with me to the Philippines on a missions trip, and we bunked together. And uh, I found out visiting with his wife, because at a funeral, whenever I'm doing a funeral, we always remember the great things about someone's past, right, and who they were, and what we can remember and hold on to. And, uh, and so she was telling me that, that when he got back from that missions trip with me, you know, this is this is great, you got to bunk with Pastor Jeff. Like, what was that like? You know, can, can you imagine the amazing story he must have come back and told? Like, what was it like to bunk with Pastor Jeff for a week on the mission field? He said, he's kind of messy. <laughs> he's kind of messy. He's kind of messy. That's what I get from week mission trip. <laughs> oh, you can do your best, but someone's going to accuse you. You're kind of messy. And they might even say, in fact, your life is all messed up. <laughs> right? Most of us, if someone's around us for any period of time, they'll probably accuse us of something. And you probably won't come out squeaky clean. Why? Because we are in process. But what beautiful, what theologians call this, is positional righteousness. Positional righteousness. So righteousness in the Bible just means you're right with God. And so positionally, he says, you're right with me. That's how I see you. That's how I love you. I see you through the lens of Jesus. You're positionally right. God has put you in a place where he never has to reject you. Isn't that incredible? That is an amen. Thank you, Dave, right there. Do you agree with Dave? Yeah, I agree with that. He's put me in a place where he never has to reject me. Why? Because of positional righteousness. When I step into that relationship with him, this relationship with the church, the scriptures often call it being in Christ. It's like that I'm in him, and when I'm in him, this relationship with Jesus, he in me and I in him, God sees me as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation, even though I've got a long ways to go. That, if you grasp it, will radically change every day of your life. It'll change the way you see yourself. And God invites you into these new lenses that, that help you see yourself well. And some of us, we don't, we have, you know, we're, we're nearsighted or we're farsighted. We don't see things well. But God says, I want to give you some new lenses so you can see perfectly well the way I see you. I see you as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. You know, a lot of us, we struggle. Um, we struggle because we just have a good forgetter. Did your forgetter work pretty good? There was an older couple and and uh, he was struggling to forgetting some things. And the wife says, well you, well, you need to go to the doctor. So they went to the doctor and he did an examination and had several questions. He goes, yeah, you've you got some, some early stages of some dementia going on here. You're forgetting things. I would really recommend that you, know, you just practice writing stuff down because it's going to help you because you're going to forget stuff. And so just write things down. They got home later that night. He says, you know, I'm going to get some ice cream. Do you want some ice cream? Asked his wife. They're watching TV. And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like some ice cream. She goes, you better write that down. He goes, <laughs> The kitchen's right there. I don't need to write that down. I'm going to go get some ice cream. And she goes, could you, get some, could you put some strawberries, some strawberry jam on top of my ice cream? He goes, sure, yeah. She goes, you better write that down. I don't have to write it down. The kitchen's right there. Could I put some whipped cream on me? Yeah, I'll put some whipped cream on there. She goes, sweetheart, what? You better write that down. I don't need to write it down. I'll write the bath. The kitchen's right there. So he goes in the kitchen, clang, clang. He's in there for about 20 minutes. He comes back with bacon and eggs. She's like, what? Can't believe you. You forgot the toast. <laughs> Some of you are a little bit like them. You got spiritual amnesia. Spiritual dementia. You forgot who you are. You forgot what God wants to do and you've got good company. There's others that forget too, but God says, what if you saw yourself as I see you every single day? I guarantee you, it would change the trajectory of that day. But see, you've got a rut in how you see yourself. It's what your father told you, maybe. You'll never amount to anything. You're a failure. You'll never be successful. And rather than what God says about you, you've got a distorted message from another father that says something about you that contaminates how you see yourself. Or maybe it's how you see your own self because of your own failures or shortcomings, or you know your addictive behavior, and so you see yourself this way and don't know how to break that habit or break that change or get out of that path, but it takes you back again and again and again to something that reaffirms who you're not and who you're stuck being. And God says, I see all of that, 
and I can change it if you're willing to transform the patterns of your thought. I can transform that. And so he invites us into this relationship where it's going to require this thing called discipline. But when I embrace how the Father sees me, I start seeing myself differently. In John chapter, 1 John 3, 1, he's overflowing. And he just says, how great is the love the Father has not just given us, but look what he's done, has lavished upon us. That means like over in abundance. Lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I'm his. I belong to him. That my discovery needs to lead to reestablishing some new patterns of thought and behavior so I can truly know what it is to have an identity that's in Christ. I see myself as him. I embrace who I am in Christ. This challenge in our thoughts will require a significant shift in how we deal with those patterns of thought and patterns of behavior because as you think, so you go. As you think, so you go. One of my favorite authors, Dallas Lord, says it like this. The ultimate freedom we have as individuals, the ultimate freedom we have as individuals, the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon or think about. And by think, we mean all the ways that we are aware of things, including memories, perceptions, and beliefs. The focus of your thoughts significantly affects and influences everything else that happens in your life and evokes the feelings that frame your world and motivate your actions. You see what he's saying? He's saying that the power of your thoughts literally have the power to create whatever emotional condition you're in. Your emotions are a trailer to your thoughts. They're a, the hitch up to your thoughts. And if, you're, if you've got your thoughts going in a, in a direction where you think nothing's going to go for you and you're a wreck and you'll never be successful, you've hitched to that your emotions and they're going to follow right along that train of thinking. As your thoughts go, your emotions will follow. And so God wants us to recognize the, the greatest freedom we have is the power to, to what we allow or select our thoughts, our mind to dwell upon. And so the scripture, the authors are saying the same thing. Neuropsychology, neuroscience, the science of the mind tells us that these ruts, these grooves in your mind literally is what creates addictive behavior. And whatever, whatever there's a trigger of some kind and the trigger might be you're alone. And so if you, know, you know when you're alone, you can do something that no one else knows you're going to do. And so when you're alone, boom, that trigger happens and you move towards that place where the alcohol is hidden or the pornography is hidden or the drugs are hidden. And you move in that space and you go down that path and you behave that way. And once again, Again, you're held captive and enslaved to how you see yourself because you've made a groove. And neuropsychology says there's something amazing that happens. The mind has what's called neuroplasticity. That means the mind is changeable. It's moldable. And so herein, science confirms what Scripture has always said. You can change your brain. You can change your brain through God's help, through God's truth. All of a sudden, what was held captive now can be made free. And so the scripture, the scripture notion of this is that we change what we meditate on. The scriptural notion of this, we change what we meditate. And my, meditate is, my ten, meditation is my focus on something. And every one of you are amazing at meditation. You are. You may, you may not realize, but you're really good at meditation. I mean, here's how I'll pitch it for you. How many of you, from every now and then, worry about something? Kind of a little, little right hand of confession. Awesome. Thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for confessing. Those of you who didn't, we accept liars here. You're welcome to be here. <laughs> welcome to We're glad to have you. <laughs> the truth is, is when you are worrying about something, you're meditating on it. You're ruminating on it. That's the idea of the Hebrew word hagah, meditate. It's to chew on something. It's like, a, it's like a cow chewing its cud. You don't, someone winced first service, you'll probably wince this service, right? What does a cow do? It chews, it digests, it regurgitates and chews on it again. Chews, swallows it, brings it back up, chews on it again. You do it all the time. You bring up what your father said. You bring up what your mother said. You bring up what your coach said. You bring up what you say, and you chew on it again and again and again. And you got to learn to spit it out. Spit it out. 
and instead start chewing on what he says. Instead, start chewing what God says about you, not what anybody else says about you. And when that happens, all of a sudden, the neuroplasticity of your brain says, I'm done with that pattern. I got a new pattern. Do you want a new pattern? God offers it up to you. When we say that we want to help nurture you, help and assist you to discover and establish and refine your spiritual identity, we're saying, we want to help you be an amazing meditator. To have a mantra in your system. And so all of our, if you haven't seen them, you can go to the website of the, of the app and you go to all of our I am statements. Those are all meditations built out of the biblical truth of who God says you are. And you, instead of saying, I am a failure, you can say, I am in Jesus You're going to be a success. You can move from your old mantra to a new mantra and say, I'm going to capture what God says about me because I want to change how I see myself. And when you do, your whole world begins to shift and move. And you come to the realization of of what a neuropsychologist, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, said in her book. When we think we change the physical nature of the brain, and we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire out toxic, what, toxic patterns. We can wire those out of our thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. And to let neuroscience affirm what God says all along, you can be changed through the truth of who I says you are. And it can change how you see yourself. He wants to do that in your day. And when that begins to be kind of a new rhythm for you, how am I seeing myself? How am I seeing myself? All of a sudden, God starts wiring you back up the way he's always wanted you to be. And will lead to the second thing that I encourage you to to recognize. We said three things. You said them all together multiple times. Let's do it again. How I see myself, how I behave myself, how I reproduce myself. How you behave yourself is a big deal. (laughs) It's a big deal, right? Because if I just keep going down that pattern, there's just a tug of war of what they say, what God says, what they say, what God says. And every time you don't correct behavior, when behavior follows that pattern, you reinforce the rut, the groove, the old message. You reinforce it. Look at our text again. Back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies, say it with me, ready to go, enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. You say, he's saying that the behavior fuels the misbeliefs. How I behave myself influences how I see myself. And I can try to change how I see myself, but I don't change how I behave myself. I'll keep going back to what I always have done and always have thought and always have believed. And so God not only wants to change how you see yourself, he wants to change how you behave yourself. Are you behaving yourself? (laughs) Uh, Not always, Pastor. Sorry. And that does what? That, That pulls me back instead of lift me up and help me go forward. So Jesus wants to not just change my ability to embrace my new identity, but he wants me to embrace new habits, new practices of how I'll choose to live and stay connected to Christ. The first is who I am in Christ. The second is how I stay connected to Christ. My behavior affirms my connection. And some of you might be saying, but pastor, I I don't really know how to do that. I, I don't know how to change my behavior. I don't know how to shift that. Aristotle said a couple things that Um, that I really resonate with. Uh, The first one is not on the screen. I'll get to this one in a little bit. But he says um, that our habits produce who we are. Our habits produce who we are. They they define us. It's the the saying that I say quite often, a, a habit's an easy bed to fall into, but a hard one to get out of. And if you keep falling into that same bed that you're an addict, that you're not worth it, that nobody loves you, that nobody cares about where you are, what you think, or what you've done, keep falling into that bed, it's a hard bed to get out of. But God can lift you out of that bed and begin to help you develop new habits that reinforce a new message and a new set of practices, a new set of behaviors, and they're wrapped up with this notion and idea that I need to train my brain and I need to cooperate with my behavior. So Aristotle says it like this, for the things you have to do before you know how to do them, you learn by doing them. For the things you need to learn before you can do them, I don't know how to do that. I need to learn it before I do it. No, you, you learn it by doing it. You just you jump in. You step in. 
And when you step into that space, you start learning and feeling and sensing what God wants you to do and who God wants you to be. And all of a sudden, what is here theoretical in your head now begins to make sense because practically you're stepping into it. And so if I want to be more loving, i got to step into being saying, I'm going to choose to give instead of receive. I'm going to choose to be generous instead of stingy. I'm going to be, be kind instead of grumpy. I'm going to step into that space. And as we do, all of a sudden we find God doing something inside of us that cooperates what he's been saying about us all the time. I start having a more holy heart. and I start sensing that, Lord, maybe your blameless place for me is a place that I can learn to live in because my new practice brings me back to the sanctuary of your presence over and over and over. And I come back to the sanctuary of his presence because it reminds me of how he sees me. And so now behaviorally, I'm coming to him again and again and again in the sanctuary of that presence. He affirms who I really am. And now I start behaving as he calls me to behave. And life's cooperative. You see, for a lot of us, it's difficult because we, we try to think about the right stuff and we just can't seem to do it. For, for some of us, we can think the new thing and start meditating on that and we feel energy and power and we just run into new behavior. For others of you, it's a little more difficult than that. You struggle with the mental part. For, so this might be true. For some of you, it might be easier to behave yourself into a new way of thinking than to think yourself into a new way of behaving. So for some of you, you'll need to behave yourself into a new way of thinking because it'll be easier than to think yourself into a new way of behaving. And so that means you carve out some right things like showing up to a small group, like having a daily quiet time, like learning to get on your knees and, and cry out to God and confess your sins. You start practicing those kind of behaviors and all of a sudden, wow, you know what? These behaviors are changing my thinking. And so both of them come together and coalesce in us being a new person that is starting to live a new life that can actually be seen and evidenced by our choices and our behavior. The author of Hebrews says it beautifully. At the time, discipline, all this thing that we say you need to have, this discipline, isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely because it's the, say with me, ready, set, go, well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. The well-trained. You're working out this thing he's working in. And as you give yourself to that training, something begins to transform who you are. He said it earlier in the book of Hebrews when he said, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have, by their powers of discernment, look what they've done. They've trained by what? Constant practice to distinguish good from evil. It's all of a sudden in the moment, wow, it's, I'm going to shift, I'm going to change that. And God begins to transform us. Um, okay, Mikey, come on up, buddy. Come on up. Run up here real quick. Welcome, my friend, Mike. Ah, uh, yeah, come on up. No, I got a, I got a microphone. <laughs> they says, uh, improvisational, be ready for Pastor Jeff to do something he's never done. Um, hey, how you doing, brother? So Mike's a part of my Tuesday night men's, men's study. Uh, so Tuesday night we've got uh, Jesus Saves Men, we got lots of amazing groups. Um, men's ministry, yeah. give it up, yeah. Any men in the house? Come on, guys. Any men in the house? This is your chance, guys. Yeah. Any men in the house? <laughs> you know, uh, being a guy um, has never been more fragile because the definition of culture and what a man does has never been more distorted. And so to become the man God wants you to be means you've got to do some things differently. You told me, uh, when you joined Tuesday night that you wanted to come because you wanted to do something. What was it? you remember? Become a disciple. Yeah. And so in your faith journey, that had been a missing, a missing piece. Mm -hmm. You said this week that you were learning to do something with these thoughts. Tell us about what they are. Uh, I'm a fisherman. Uh-huh. Catch yeah, the yeah, thought. Yeah. Catch the thought. Uh, catch it, release it, and replace it with the Word of God. Nice. How's that working for you? Awesome. Awesome. Give him a hand, would you? Thank you. I just wanted you to share that discovery. You shared that. You can go that way. Beautiful. God wants us to learn little things, and it doesn't matter where you learn them. It matters that you learn them. 
and that you hold on to them. One of the powerful things that, that Mike's learning to do, and last service I brought up another guy that's learning to do, is, is you're learning in the midst when that thought, and that trigger happens, you're all alone. When that trigger happens, you're angry. That trigger happens, you feel betrayed. That trigger happens, someone says something critical and you're defensive. That trigger happens, that kicks you into that groove, that path, that pattern, is to stop. Just stop. Stop. Make space for it. Look at it. Catch it. And release it. Because it will never serve you. It won't serve you. Just catch it and release it and replace it. Jesus, that was the old me that was alienated from God. But now, because of what Jesus has done, I can see myself differently. And I can behave myself differently. Catch and release. God wants to empower you, not just to change how you see yourself, but how you behave yourself. When that happens, everything starts to change. You learn in five different ways. I'm going to say these really quick. Uh, we'll come back to them again because you need to be reminded. Um, we learn in five different ways, five different modalities of learning. The first one you're doing now. You're listening and you're doing a great job being a remote. Shh. Right? It's the Western mode of, of, mode of modality of learning. Lecture, listener. That's what we do all through school. Someone lectures and we listen. And when you do that, you're recording. The problem is your recordings are not very good. You forget a bunch. <laughs> so Jesus up the ante. Jesus did not say, I'm giving a, a lecture on how to know my kingdom and my righteousness at the synagogue this week. Please come. He didn't do it that way. He said, come follow me. And as the disciples followed him, what happened is, is he brought them into the second modality of learning, dialogue. This is where I start to talk about what I, what I believe, what I think I believe, what I used to believe, what I don't, don't think, know if I should believe. I begin to talk about those and wrestle with those things. Jesus did it again and again and again and again. The disciples watched and then, they, and then they had dialogue. He taught and then they had dialogue. That's what a small group is about. I said a few weeks ago that we don't learn in rows, we learn in circles. You learn some in rows, but you learn more in circles. Because in a circle, I'm going to start dialoguing, talking about what we just, we just discovered and what we picked up on. The next thing we do is we watch. When we watch, we research. They watch Jesus, and they research. What is he doing now? Why is he doing that? When you are in a relationship with someone else who's a little further along with you, watch them. Why do they do what they do? We watch, we research, we learn. The fourth one is we memorize. I hope you memorize. Uh, I like to memorize. Do you like to memorize? I know you don't like to memorize. Okay. Uh, but the problem with not memorizing is you forget. How do you remember so much stuff, Pastor? I memorize. I practice that muscle. That's how I can remember a bunch of stuff. And so it's another way. Because we remember. How can you live what you forget? Pretty hard. And so that's why you're going to walk out of here remembering that how I see myself, how I how I might just stick. It might just stick. But if you went home all week long and every day you said, Jesus, change how I see myself, Lord. Lord Jesus, change how I behave myself. And Lord, help me change how I reproduce myself. If you did that every day, you would come back next week and you would pass with flying colors. And in America, they give you an A because you remembered it. In the Western modality. But Jesus cranks it up. And it's not just about lecture learner. It's not just about dialogue. It's not just about watching. It's not just about memorizing. It's about participating. He says, go and do as I have done to you. Jump in. Behave your way into a new way of being like me. And all of a sudden, you're someone different. You've changed how you behave yourself. There was a a fellow that was a um, classic uh, violinist in the late 1800s. His name was Fritz uh, Chrysler, and he was Australian. He was such an amazing violinist that he literally was on a world tour. Isn't it kind of funny to think about that late 1800s, someone being on a world tour? Well, Fritz was. Fritz toured the world, London, 
Berlin, uh, Europe, uh, uh, the, the Asian nations, America. In America, he came in 1888 and did a, did a tour of America playing his violin, would fill stadiums and, and uh, opera houses. Uh, they liked him so much, they brought him back. In, in 1901 and 1902, they brought him back for a return tour, like Elton John's finishing his tour, right? He came back again and did another tour of America. Amazing violinist, spectacular, held audiences in awe. One time while in Hamburg, Germany, he was getting ready to board a ship to head to London. Uh, he had a, about 45 minutes to kill because he was early. And he looked on the, on the waterfront and there's some little shops and he noticed one of those was a music shop. And so he went to the music shop and he walked in with his violin because he wouldn't put it with his other things because um, it was cherished. It was a very prized violin. Walked into the little music shop and the, and the guy says, hey, do you play the violin? He goes, yeah, I do. He goes, can I see your violin? So he opens it up for the, for the shopkeeper. He took one look at the violin, recognizing that it was like a Stradivarius. It was, a, it was an amazing violin. And he recognized it, that it was the, the violin of the, great, of the great performer. Looked at the man, ran out the door. Fritz is thinking, do I, do I stink? What's, what's wrong? Why did he leave? Why, why did he exit so quickly? He's gone for a few minutes and he runs back in with two policemen. They grab Fritz under his arm and they start to haul him off. He goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? He goes, we're arresting you. Why? Because you've stolen Fritz Chrysler's violin. They're hauling him out. He goes, I am Chris. I am Fritz Chrysler. That's my violin. No, it's not. You're a thief. We're taking you away. He says, please, let me play the violin. They thought, well, what harm could that do? Whoa. They release him. He opens the violin case and plays a melody sweet enough to make everyone grin. And all that were there were amazed by the sound that came out of that violin. Surely this was no novice. This was the maestro. They said, oh, Mr. Chrysler, we are so sorry. Please, please take your violin, board your ship, and please say nothing of the bad policeman work in, 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 in Hamburg. As he walked off with his violin, everyone knew that his behavior validated and confirmed his true identity. God wants to do the same through you. He wants your behavior to confirm who you really are that you belong to the Son of God, that he paid for you with the redemption of his blood, that he's brought you into a fellowship where he sees you as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. Can your behavior move in that direction? It can. If you rewire your brain, if you train your brain to think like him, Jesus invites you into discipleship. The process of being formed in the image of Jesus for the sake of others. We're going to change, aren't we? Aren't we? How we see ourselves. How we and how we well, let me just talk just briefly about that and I'll let you go. We, um, we are called to be reproducers. Jesus took these 11 guys and think about these 11 guys, right? I said the size of the task. Amazing. They stepped up. They showed up despite the size of the task. They stepped up despite the size of the task. Remember that last week? 11 guys make disciples of all nations. I've been going like, how many nations are there exactly? Right? 11 guys, all nations. So if you and I said, okay, pastor, we want to do it. So if year one, if we said this year, and by the way, this year ahead, next year, uh, I've got a discipleship. I've got a, a training program that I want us all to do. And I'm hoping that you'll just begin to kind of think about that and say, I want to do pastor's training program. Because if we said in year one, um, year one, I would mentor you, one plus one, we would have two of us, right? That'd be pretty fun, Right? Uh, and then year two, we both did it again. We would have four, right? Then we would have eight and then 16. And then by year number five, we would have 32. Okay, we're, okay I get you, Pastor. And then year six, we'd have 64, 128. Then do the math and we would have 256, which would move to 512. And by year 10, we would have one. 1024. 
And then if we skip to year 15, by 15, we'd have 32,768. And then if we made it to year 20, we would have 1,048,576. God wants you to invest in eternity. And it happens one person at a time. Will you invest? Will you say, it's time I start investing in something that will change me and change my world? Or do I want to stay where I am, alienated from God? Or do I want to step into this space and how I see myself as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation? That's how he sees you. And then I say, I want to change how I behave myself so one day I can actually say I've changed how I reproduce myself. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, we, we know, God, that we've got some patterns that just aren't healthy. I just want to invite you into the space where we can acknowledge to Jesus that we need him. And that's no okay, that's no okay place to be. That we know and recognize that when we accept where we are, we can declare that's not where we have to stay. Today has nothing to do with making you feel terrible about where you are. It doesn't. It's intended to fill you with hope about where you can be. And Jesus sees that in you. And so I want to invite you just to invite him into your, into your space of your soul and heart and just whisper, Jesus, please fill me with you. Just whisper that. Jesus, please fill me with you. Forgive me for my patterns that are so unhealthy. Jesus, help me change by your grace how I see myself, how I behave myself, how I reproduce myself. And Lord God, we ask that you help us to be, to be the kind of followers that uh, don't omit the fact that we want to be like you, so we've got to be a student of you. And we don't omit the fact that we need training to obey everything you commanded. We simply acknowledge and ask you to fill us up, Lord, with this deeper awareness of your truth, your presence, your spirit. The fact that you've put us in a place where you never have to reject us because of how much you love us. Just breathe that in. Just take a nice deep breath. Just breathe that in. Lord, we breathe you in. We take you in. In Jesus' name, amen.